Those of you who have seen the film Moneyball or have read the book by Michael Lewis will be familiar with the story of Billy Bean. Billy was supposed to be a tremendous ball player. All the scouts told him so. They told his parents that. They predicted that he was going to be a star. But what actually happened when he signed a contract, and by the way, he didn't want to sign that contract. He wanted to go to college, which is what my mother, who actually does love me, said that I should do too, and I did. Well, he didn't do very well. He struggled mightily. He got traded a couple times. He ended up in the minors for most of his career. And he actually ended up in management. He ended up as a general manager of the Oakland A's. Now, for many of you in this room, ending up in management, which is also what I've done, is seen as a success. I can assure you that for a kid trying to make it in the bigs, going into management ain't no success story. It's a failure. And what I want to talk to you about today and, and share with you is that our healthcare system, our medical system, is just as bad at predicting what happens to people in it, patients, others, as those scouts were at predicting what would happen to Billy Bean. And yet, every day, thousands of people in this country are diagnosed with preconditions. We hear about prehypertension, we hear about pre-dementia. We hear about pre-anxiety, and I'm pretty sure that I diagnosed myself with that in the green room. <laughs> we also refer to subclinical conditions. There's subclinical atherosclerosis, subclinical hardening of the arteries, obviously linked to heart attacks, potentially. Um, one of my favorites is called subclinical acne. And if you look up subclinical acne, you may find a website, which I did, which says that this is the easiest type of acne to treat. <laughs> you don't have the pustules or the redness and inflammation. Maybe that's because you don't actually have acne. <laughs> I, I have a, a name for all of these conditions. It's another precondition. I call them preposterous. <laughs> you know, in baseball, the game follows the pregame, the season follows the preseason. But with a lot of these conditions, that actually isn't the case, or at least it isn't the case all the time. It's as if there's a rain delay every single time in many cases. We have precancerous lesions, which often don't turn into cancer. And yet, if you take, for example, subclinical osteoporosis, a bone thinning disease a precondition, otherwise known as osteopenia, you would have to treat 270 women for three years in order to prevent one broken bone. That's an awful lot of women when you multiply by the number of women who are diagnosed with this osteopenia. And so is it any wonder, given all of the costs and the side effects of the drugs that we're using to treat these preconditions, that every year we're spending more than $2 trillion on health care, and yet 100,000 people a year, and that's a conservative estimate, are dying not because of the conditions they have, but because of the treatments that we're giving them and the complications of those treatments. We've medicalized everything in this country. Uh, women in the audience, I have some pretty bad news that you already know, and that's that every aspect of your life has been medicalized. Strike one is when you hit puberty. You now have something that happens to you once a month that has been medicalized. It's a condition. It has to be treated. Strike two is if you get pregnant, you have, that's been medicalized as well. You have to have a high-tech experience of pregnancy, otherwise something might go wrong. Strike three is menopause. We all know what happened when millions of women were given hormone replacement therapy for, for menopausal symptoms for decades until all of a sudden we realized, because a study came out, a big one, NIH funded, that said actually a lot of that hormone replacement therapy may be doing more harm than good for many of those women. And just in case I don't want to leave the men out, I am one after all, I have really bad news for all of you in this room and for everyone listening and watching elsewhere. You all have a universally fatal condition. So just take a moment. It's called pre-death. <laughs> Every single one of you has it because you have the risk factor for it, which is being alive. But I have some good news for you, because I'm a journalist. I like to end things in a happy way or a forward-thinking way. And that good news is that if you can survive to the end of my talk, which we'll see if that happens for everyone, 
you will be a previvor. <laughs> now, I made up pre-death. If I used someone else's pre-death, I apologize. I think I made it up. I didn't make up previvor. Previvor is what a particular cancer advocacy group would like everyone who just has a risk factor but hasn't actually had that cancer to call themselves. You are a previvor. We've had HBO here this morning. I'm wondering if Mark Burnett is anywhere in the audience. I'd like to suggest a, you know, a reality TV show called Previvor. If you develop a disease, you're off the island. <laughs> but the problem is we have a system that has completely, basically promoted this. We've selected at every point in this system to do what we do and to give everyone a precondition and then eventually a condition in some cases. Start with the doctor-patient relationship. Doctors, most of them, are in a fee-for-service system. They are basically incentivized to do more procedures, tests, prescribed medications. Patients come to them, they want to do something. We're Americans, we have to, we can't just stand there, we have to do something. And so they want a drug, they want a treatment, they want to be told, this is what you have, this is how you treat it. And if you, the doctor doesn't give you that, you go somewhere else. That's not very good for a doctor's business. Or, even worse, if you are diagnosed with something eventually and the doctor didn't order that test, you get sued. We have pharmaceutical companies that are constantly trying to expand the indications, expand the number of people who are eligible for a given treatment because it obviously helps their bottom line. We have advocacy groups, like the one that's come up with Previvor, who want to make more and more people feel they at, are at risk or might have a condition so that they can raise more funds and raise visibility, etc. But this isn't actually, despite what journalists typically do, this isn't actually about blaming particular players. We are all responsible. I'm responsible. I actually root for the Yankees. I mean, talk about being sort of rooting for the worst possible offender when it comes to doing everything you can do. Thank you. <laughs> but everyone is responsible. Um, I, you know, went to medical school and I, was, I didn't have a course called How to Think Skeptically or How Not to Order Tests. We have this sort of system where, you know, that's what you do. And it actually took being a journalist, you know, to understand all these incentives. You know, economists like to say, there are no bad people, there are just bad incentives. And that's actually true. Because what we've created is a sort of field of dreams when it comes to medical technology, right? So when you put an MRI, another MRI in every corner, you put a robot in every hospital saying that everyone has to have robotic surgery, well, we've created a system where if you build it, they will come. But you can actually perversely tell people to come, tell them, convince them that they have to come. But it was when I became a journalist that I really realized how I was part of this problem and how we all are part of this problem. I was medicalizing every risk factor. I was writing stories, commissioning stories every day that were trying to sort of not necessarily make people worried, although that was what often happened. But, you know, there are ways out. I saw my own internist last week. And... He said to me, you know, and he told me something that everyone in this audience could have told me for free, but I paid him for the privilege, which is that I need to lose some weight. Well, he's right. I've had honest to goodness high blood pressure for a dozen years now, same age my father got it. And it's a real disease. It's not prehypertension, it's actual hypertension, high blood pressure. Well, he's right. And that's, but he didn't say to me, well, you have pre-obesity or you have pre-diabetes or anything like that. He didn't say, better start taking this statin. You need to lower your cholesterol. No, he said, go out and lose some weight. Come back and see me in a bit. Or just give me a call and let me know how you're doing. So that's, to me, you know, a way forward. Billy Bean, by the way, learned the same thing. He learned from watching this kid who he eventually hired, who was really successful for him, that it wasn't swinging for the fences. It wasn't swinging at every pitch like the sluggers do, which is what all the expensive teams like the Yankees like to, they like to pick up those guys. This kid told them, you know, you've got to watch the guys and you've got to go out and find the guys who like to walk. Because getting on base by a walk is just as good. And in our healthcare system, we need to figure out, is that really a good pitch or should we let it go by and not swing at everything? Thanks. <laughs>